Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Diane Zamora? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Diane Zamora was born in Crowley, Texas on January 21, 1978. Her mother was a nurse and her father an electrician. Diane was the eldest of four children. The family was deeply religious. When Diane was nine years old, she said she wanted to become an astronaut. When she was in high school, Diane was described as careful and conscientious. She was particularly distrustful of boys. She did not have sex with boys. She dumped one boyfriend because he made it clear that was his desire. She really wanted to focus on school as opposed to romance. Diane was described as naive, isolated, and quiet. She generally kept to herself. She associated with other good students and avoided traditional socializing. Diane did not involve herself in gossip. Diane met a teenager named David Graham at a Civil Air Patrol meeting in 1991. There was no romantic interest at that time, but four years later they started dating, even though they attended different high schools. Diane attended school in Crowley, whereas David was in Mansfield, about a half hour away. The couple had a lot in common. David wanted to be a fighter pilot, and of course Diane wanted to be an astronaut. David was described as intelligent, muscular, respectful. He spoke to adults by saying, yes sir, and yes ma'am. Some female high school students who knew him called him the perfect guy. He never committed any offenses when he was in school. He was a little socially awkward, but not enough to attract a lot of negative attention. Several students in the school considered him an acquaintance, but not exactly a friend. It was difficult to really get to know him because of the social awkwardness piece. David and Diane became engaged a month after they started dating. They intended to marry in August of 2000, after they graduated from military academies. Diane's priorities appeared to shift a bit at this point. She seemed very focused on David, although she was still committed to being a good student and building a career. Family and friends of Diane generally liked David, even though they found him a little bit peculiar. They believe he genuinely cared for Diane. He did not try to pressure Diane into having sex, but the couple would have sex fairly soon after their engagement. At this point, Diane appeared to be confused, guilty, and ashamed. She became extremely committed to David, suggesting that she would rather die than not be with him. One of David's classmates was a teenager named Adrian Jones. Adrian's classmates referred to her as flirtatious. She was quite popular in school with a number of the male students. At some point, Adrian became romantically interested in David. David would later claim that on November 4, 1995, just a couple months after being engaged, he gave Adrian Jones a ride to her residence from a regional meet for the cross-country team. They were both on this team. During the trip, he stopped his vehicle and had sex with her. Sometime after claiming this, he said that his original claim was false. Then after that, he once again said it was true. It's not clear what actually happened. Diane found out about this sexual encounter during the course of an argument with David about a month later. At this point, Diane started thinking about Adrian Jones no longer being alive. She wanted David to make this happen. Diane threatened to bring an end to her own life if he did not comply. The pair conspired to kill Adrian Jones. On December 3, 1995, David contacted Adrian at about 10.30 p.m. to arrange a sexual encounter. Adrian was interested. On December 4, at about 1.30 a.m., David picked up Adrian and a Mazda protege, which belonged to Diane's parents. What Adrian did not know is that Diane was hiding in the trunk of the car and in the possession of weights, which were there to weigh down Adrian's body after the couple murdered her. David parked in a secluded area near a lake. Adrian reclined in the passenger seat in an effort to facilitate sex. David acted like he was going to kiss Adrian as he signaled Diane. She pushed the back seat forward and confronted Adrian. According to Diane, she asked Adrian if she had sex with David in November. Diane responded that she did, but she did not enjoy it because 
she felt guilty. Diane flew into a rage, presumably because of Adrian's admission about having sex as opposed to feeling guilty about it. David attacked Adrian, and Diane hit her in the head with a barbell. Injured but still conscious, Adrian crawled out of the window and started to flee, but she did not make it far. David produced a 9mm pistol and shot her twice, once in the left cheek and once in her forehead. When David and Diane returned to the vehicle, they exchanged I love yous. Diane added, we shouldn't have done that, a sentiment that would have been helpful a few minutes earlier. David and Diane left Adrian's body in the field and drove to a friend's house. They asked the friend if they could change their clothes and spend some time there. Later that same day, Adrian's body was found in the field. The police were confused by the circumstances of her death. There was no sign of a struggle at the crime scene. She had not been the victim of an assault of a sexual nature. They checked out her residence and found that nobody had broken in, so it wasn't like she had been kidnapped. The police determined she must have known her killer. The police started asking questions at Mansfield High School, looking for any students who had been involved even in minor trouble. I think this is important because it shows how even getting in small scrapes with the law can lead to being investigated, which of course can lead to false accusations. The police found one student who thought that her boyfriend had sex with one of Adrian's friends. She attacked that friend with a baseball bat and shot her boyfriend. Apparently, the student had also threatened Adrian. Many people thought that this teenager was the killer. She checked all the boxes, but the police cleared her after determining she had an alibi. Moving to the next lead, the police talked to a young man named Brian McMillan, who was very interested in Adrian. He used to stop by a subway shop where she once worked. Adrian would hide behind the counter to avoid him. When the police found out that Brian had a mental illness, specifically depression, they became very confident he must have been involved. Here we see a fairly strong bias against the mentally ill, which is quite common among law enforcement. Brian didn't do himself any favors during his interviews with the police. First he said he didn't know Adrian, then he changed his mind and admitted he did know her. He wasn't sure if he talked to her the night before she went missing. He said he may have driven to her house and picked her up, but he didn't remember. On December 15, 1995, Brian was arrested for murder, but he was soon released as the case fell apart. At this point, the police were out of ideas. They already exhausted their go-to tactic of falsely accusing somebody. What else were they going to do? As all this was going on, Dave and Diane went on with their lives. David went to the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, and Diane went to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. When at the Academy, Diane told a potential love interest about the homicide, but he didn't tell anybody. He would later be kicked out of the Academy for failing to report Diane. In late August 1996, Diane told her two roommates about the murder. So once again, she was telling the story. They contacted a Navy chaplain who contacted a Navy attorney who called the police. Diane was questioned by detectives and Navy officials. She denied committing the murder, saying that she was just trying to impress her roommates. She wanted to look tough. In 1996, the slogan for the Navy was, You and the Navy, full speed ahead. Perhaps what Diane heard was, you and the Navy, homicide ahead. It's an honest mistake. I could picture her saying, that doesn't sound right, but what are you going to do? You have to live up to the slogan. The police interviewed David not long after this. He said he couldn't imagine why Diane would fabricate a story of murder. David did not hold up well during questioning. He ended up confessing. The police spoke to Diane again, and she confessed as well. David and Diane were arrested on September 6, 1996, and charged with capital murder. In both of their confessions, their stories were relatively consistent. Later, they would each recant their confessions and point the finger at each other. Diane's trial started in February of 1998. She said that she was there when the crime was committed, but did not participate. She was found guilty of capital murder and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 40 years. She continues to blame her former lover. David went to trial in July of 1998. He was found guilty and received the same sentence as Diane. David has said that his sentence is just. Now moving to my analysis. Both David and Diane were somewhat unusual teenagers who were focused on their future careers and generally stayed out of trouble. 
It seemed like everything was going okay for them until they became romantically involved with each other. After this, they seemed to have an obsessive, unhealthy relationship that involved calling each other pet names like tiger and kittens. They had formed this ideal in their minds. They had obtained the perfect love, a love that could not be tainted or disrespected without consequences. Initially, they didn't see any option but to be with one another. They became fixated on the idea that their relationship could never end. On November 4, 1995, Adrian Jones asked David for a ride home. She had always liked him, and she saw this as an opportunity to have sex with him. Little did Adrian know that she was encroaching on a couple who believed their love was sacred. David experienced a lot of guilt and shame and eventually told Diane this led to the murder plot. I think that this couple believed that murder would erase the stain on their perfect relationship. It would grant them absolution. They could start over, as if their love had never been insulted by sexual temptation and gratification. What they failed to understand was that murder was more serious than the perceived offense against the relationship. After the homicide, they both felt guilty and ashamed. Now the feelings were even more intense than what they had been about the indiscretion before. Diane would regularly vomit, just like people who were forced to hear the couple call each other tiger and kittens. They couldn't stand being reminded of their crime. Diane avoided riding in the Mazda Protégé. The couple recoiled when people mentioned the Mansfield High School student who was murdered. In one way, they grew to appreciate the seriousness of their behavior, but still didn't understand how unpleasant it would be to spend their entire lives in prison. Diane confessed to her roommates, denied it when the police questioned her, only to confess again after David confessed. Now, trapped in prison probably for the rest of her life, Diane no longer considers the relationship she had with David to be perfect. Now it's every killer for themselves. She came up with this convoluted, difficult-to-believe story about how he was really the killer, she wasn't involved, she was there but didn't do anything. She's just desperately saying anything that she can to escape responsibility. Interestingly, David has accepted responsibility, and even though he played the finger-pointing game just like Diane, he is satisfied with his prison sentence. I'm sure the prison is thrilled to have a satisfied customer for a change. Moving to my final thoughts, Dave and Diane were two teenagers who formed a dangerous relationship by defining it as unassailable. They were too mature to be in a relationship. They did not understand their feelings. They were both naive and inexperienced in romance. Dave and Diane were fixated with military order. They viewed themselves as part of a world with absolute rules and definite consequences. This overcommitment to regulations and laws became misinterpreted through the cloudy lens of their toxic relationship and led them to deciding that murder was a necessary atonement for their sins. Now they have the rest of their lives to atone for the grave sin of murder. Diane always wanted to be an astronaut. She did not achieve her goal, but prison is cold, cramped, dangerous, and has terrible food, so at least she has obtained an experience which approximates life in a spaceship. Those are my thoughts on the case of Diane Zamora. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.